Okay, uh, we're going to start the lecture. Uh, the lecture this morning is on calculation and socialism. And this is one of the most important topics in Austrian economics, calculation and, and socialism. Calm down. I mean, Sean's wasn't that good. Uh, you're all excited. So as, as we'll see, um, calculation and socialism, is re the, the topic is really at the core of economic theory. That is at the core of Austrian economic theory. Um, one of the most, one of the, the, the greatest articles written, or the greatest article written in the 20th century was written by Ludwig von Mises, and it was his article called Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth. It was written in 1920. I highly recommend you read it. It's, it's in pamphlet form. Um, the article um, the completely destroyed the intellectual foundations of socialism, which is now a very hot topic and something you should be aware of, what, what socialism exactly is and, and what its problems are. But secondly, it also really was a revolutionary breakthrough um, which demonstrated the true nature and function of the price system. And the price system is at the core of the free market economy. I also note that there's a very important epilogue in, uh, that, in this um, pamphlet, okay, by a, a modern Austrian economist that you, you might want to read. So it explains and, and updates Mises' um, article. Okay. Okay, so let me give you some background. Before Mises came onto the scene, um, there were two kinds of socialism, and, and the first kind was called utopian socialism, so named by Karl Marx. Uh, so utopian socialism um, was advocated by a number of people, but there were three very famous advocates, two French um, men and, and, and one uh, Scott. Um, so uh, Charles Fourier, Henri Saint-Simon, and uh, Robert Owen. Now, they had some crazy schemes about how socialism would work. Okay, they, they, each of them had their own view of what a social society would be, and it was very detailed. Right? On the other hand, later on, Karl Marx and, and his collaborator, Frederick Engels, came onto the scene, uh, and they criticized, as we'll see, the utopian socialism socialists, okay, precisely for the, for the fact that this, the utopian socialists were, were actually trying to elaborate and explain what socialism would look like. And this is one of the greatest polemical ploys in intellectual history. As we'll see, Marx basically said, if you talk about what socialism is going to look like, you're unscientific. Because socialism is going to come whether we like it or not. And no matter what you do, um, you cannot speed it up or you cannot change what it will look like. Socialism will arise on the scene um, with the inexorable laws of history, okay? Just as, for example, feudalism replaced the classical slave societies of Greece and Rome, capitalism replaced feudalism, and socialism will inexorably replace capitalism. And then there was an, another stage of, of pure communism. But as we'll see, Marx didn't talk about any of this. But let's look at... Um, uh, now that's, you know, that face really betrays what, what this person is thinking, okay? <laughs> that is, he's nuts, okay? So let me just focus on Fourier, okay, as, 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 as a, a, a utopian socialist. So he had this idea that society would be organized according to Greek military formations under socialism, the phalanx there, which is a, which is a French word for the, 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 the Greek phalanx. Um, he, and he, he gave some specific information about this. He said, well, there'd be garden cities, they'd be modeled after a grand hotel, and each one would contain 15 to 1,600 residents, okay? Um, every resident would be able to purchase accommodations according to individual tastes and, and income. He wasn't a, an income redistributionist. Uh, all residents would be a stockholder in the city. There would be collective production. Everybody would work together to produce for the city. All would sh share meals in the communal kitchen. And um, the dirty work would be shared. Right? Now, he didn't say how this stuff would, would occur, but somehow this was the right way to do things. And, this, and, and, and so he was going to himself try to bring this about. 
to his followers. He even he drew, drew a sketch, okay? Now, all utopian socialists seem to have a mania for perfect symmetry. Notice how that's perfectly symmetrical, okay? That's uh, one of the uh, uh, Fallon stairs. Um, and that is a model. He actually built a model of it, okay, an architect's model. But he, he was even crazier than that. Um, now, this is, by the way, near where I grew up in New Jersey. This is what some of his followers actually built a Fallon stair. Now, that's that compare the, the, the pretty picture that people paint of socialism or the model they build of socialism to what it actually turns out to look like. Okay, a spook house. It's scary. Okay, it's it ugly, dilapidated. I mean, that's what socialism would do to the economy. Okay, so what are some of his ramblings? Okay, so he claimed uh, that, uh, as I told you, it was crazy, that France was in the fifth stage of advancement. Okay, it passed through confusion, savagery, patriarchism, and barbarity. But after passing through two more stages, now he knew this all exactly. How, how do you know this stuff? We get, all of them assume that they had some sort of an intuition, what's called a gnosis, a secret source of knowledge that no one else had or had access to. Um, so after passing through two more stages, it would approach the upward slope of harmony. That would be the final stage, would be utter bliss, and it would last for 8,000 years. Okay? Then history would reverse itself and run backwards to the first stage. Okay? So uh, people took him seriously. Okay. Uh, he also went on and pointed out that uh, six new moons in this, new, this final stage would replace the one in existence. Uh, there would be a halo showering gentle dew around the North Pole. Um, there would be seas would turn to Kool-Aid, okay? <laughs> All violent or repulsive beasts would be replaced by their opposites. There would be anti-lions that would offer some, themselves to be ridden by, by human beings. There would be uh, anti-chickens that would fly, uh, roasted chickens would fly into people's mouths and, and so on. Um, so, I mean, he was taken, see, now you see why Marx was embarrassed by all this, okay? <laughs> Okay, and the human lifespan in the, uh, the, the last harmonic stage would stretch to 144 years and five-sixths of the time would be devoted to unrestrained pursuit of sexual love. All of these guys were sex maniacs. They all, they all believed in free love, okay? Okay, so before we get to Marx, the classical economists just destroyed these guys, destroyed their writings, just with simple supply and demand. They said, look, there's an incentive problem. Who's going to take out the garbage under socialism? Okay. How are you going to get people to take out the garbage? Um, we know how we get people to take out the garbage or do dirty, dangerous jobs like going down deep into coal mines and, 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 and breathing potentially noxious fumes. We, we pay them. Okay. We pay them a differential above other types of work that require the same skill. But that wouldn't exist under socialism. Well, the socialists had an answer. They said, well, a new economic man would appear on the scene who didn't work for money but worked for the approval of society and the improvement of society. Um, but what both sides implicitly assumed, even the classical economists, they, they assumed that uh, the, the incentive problem, if it were solved, and they didn't think it could be solved, and they were right, it, could, it can't be solved, but they assumed that if it were solved, well, socialism could be just as productive as capitalism. Okay, so everyone assumed that. Now Marx, as I said, he had a brilliant polemical ploy. He wanted, he wanted to bury the utopian socialists. He wanted to shut them up and, and ne never hear from them again. And he, in a way, he, he succeeded. He devised his own theory of scientific socialism, okay, and basically what it said was, look, there's these inexorable laws of history, just like we have inexorable laws of the physical world, um, like gravity and so on. Um, and they dictate that, that socialism will replace capitalism. That's coming whether human beings want it or not. Um, therefore, given that, it was unscientific to speculate about what socialism would look like, and it was unscientific to try to speed it up or to try to, um, deter, to, try to come up with a scheme which it would follow when, when, when it did come on the scene. Okay. So... After, no one wanted to be known as unscientific, so the, these other socialists all shut up. They followed Marx. They, they said, you know what, we're not going to talk about it. Okay? In, fact, Mark, in fact, Marx did not talk about it. Um, what was his great work? His 
He only published one volume in his lifetime, but the other two were published after he died. The three-volume work was Das Kapital, C Capital. What did he talk about? He only talked about the contradictions of capitalism and how capitalism was going to collapse. He never said a word about socialism, okay? Because he was scientific, all right? Really, because he knew if he said anything about it, he'd be laughed at, just like utopian socialists were laughed at and destroyed by the, by the classical economists. And that's where Mises comes on the scene with his great impossibility thesis. Basically, he said that, look, in, in a developed market economy with hundreds, th thousands and thousands of different capital goods, with, with a multitude of different kinds of labor and other resources, with technology continually changing, okay, you could not engage in rational production without economic calculation. Okay, that was his thesis. It would be impossible under socialism to rationally allocate resources. That is, to allocate resources to the most important uses of consumers or even of the planners themselves because they would have no test of whether this allocation of resources, whether producing some things and not producing other things, whether producing with a certain technology and not another technology, whether or not that was the most valuable, value productive way um, to go about uh, producing goods. So here's what Mises' argument, step by step. It was very simple. It's, 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 it's simple and straightforward to follow. And it's surprising that no one else had come up with it before, though there were economists before Mises, some, some economists, that came up with pieces of the argument. So basically, he points out, look, what is socialism? Socialism is the collective ownership of the means of production. So that means that socialism abolishes private property in the means of production, in factories, mines, farms, not necessarily in consumer goods, okay? You own your own clothing, you own your own food, and so on, after you've purchased, worked and, and purchased it. But only the state, okay, and the Central Planning Bureau owns, in the name of society, of course, all of the, the, the capital goods uh, um, and, and, and uh, all natural resources. However, if the state is the sole owner of all the natural resources and all the capital goods, then there can be no prices for these things, okay? Because they can't be exchanged, right? You can't exchange with yourself. There has to be different values. There ha people have to have different value scales for different things for these things to be exchanged. But if there's only one mind, there can be no exchange, okay? With no exchange, there's no market prices. If you don't have any market prices, how do you know your costs of production? You can't calculate costs of production. So even if, under socialism, consumers were paid, okay, let's say in the Soviet Union they were paid rubles, um, and they therefore were, were, were free to purchase whatever they wanted or whatever the state produced, there may very well be prices. Let's assume the state didn't set the prices, and actually they did. But let's assume they, they allowed price of consumer goods to be determined by the supply of goods they produced and, and the demand that the workers had for those goods. Even that wouldn't be enough, those prices, right? Because what do you compare them to? What do you, you compare the output prices to? There, there, there are no prices of the resources that produce these things. Um, and, and so therefore, the state cannot calculate the cost of production. And the absence of calculation of profit and loss, socialist planners cannot know the most valuable uses of different resources. So you would have chaotic production under socialism. That was Mises' argument, okay? Once you abolish ownership of the factors of production, the non-material, the non uh, rather the non-human material factors of production, okay, all the factories and machinery and, and, and mines and farms and so on, then there can be no market prices for these things. So what is the essential mark of socialism? It is in force. It isn't the fact that you have a dictator, okay? The, the, the essential mark of socialism is that there's only one will acting in production, one will determining, even if it's a collective of people, okay? They, they all own these resources and they're, they're trying to determine what to produce. So Mises says the essential mark of socialism is that one will alone acts. It is immaterial whose will it is. It could be very benevolent, uh, angel-like, um, a dictator, or it could be a, an evil uh, a Stalin or Pol Pot type. It doesn't matter, 
okay? The main thing is that the employment of all factors of production is directed by one agency only. So it could be an agency of, of human beings, but, but they all come to a, a collective judgment about how, how to um, uh, organize and, and, and produce. One will alone chooses, decides, directs, acts, gives orders. The distinctive mark of socialism is the oneness and indivisibility of the will directing all production activities within the whole social system. So Murray Rothbard, by the way, took this further and said, that's why on a free market you could never even have one huge firm, one very successful entrepreneur, a group of entrepreneurs, um, organizing all production in one firm. Because at that point they, they would abolish the markets for different capital goods and, 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 and natural resources and there would be no prices and the whole thing would fall apart. Right. So what are the preconditions of economic calculation? The preconditions, as, as, as Mises pointed out, was that there was private property in all the stages of goods, including capital goods of every kind. Okay. So we have private property. Uh, the freedom to exchange, not only can you own things, but you can exchange them, you can alienate them okay, by exchanging them with someone else. You can give them up in exchange for, for, for other goods and services. Uh, for example, in, in um, medieval England, you could not exchange family land. Even though you could own it, okay, the land had to stay in the family. Okay? It could be broken up and sold. Okay? And there had to be sound money, money which was not unduly influenced by political factors, okay? money which retained its value so that entrepreneurs could use it to calculate costs and, and benefits. But socialism abolishes all of these three preconditions, and therefore socialism abolishes the market for, for factors of production, and it abolishes the division of labor, which we've, we've talked about, and as, and as a result of that, as we'll see, society cannot exist above a very primitive level under socialism. So let's talk a little bit more about this problem. Um, a production function is really a recipe of, about, uh, for how to produce a good, how to technically produce a good. So let's say uh, a socialist planner wants to produce a car. Um, he knows the amount of, there's P tons of steel, there's a certain number of hours of machine time, certain number of hours of, of, of unskilled labor, there's uh, engineering labor, there's certain square feet of tac uh, factory space, kilowatt hours of electricity and gallons of paint and so on. And this is the car that you get, which is a, a Chevy. Uh, Chevrolet produced a, a number of years ago, three or four years ago. Um, so the problem wasn't knowing how to produce this car. In fact, the problem is that there's a lot of different ways of producing this car. And the socialist planner could not know the correct way to produce this car, or even if he should produce, let's say, uh, 100,000 of these cars, or maybe use the resources to produce a million bicycles or 50,000 apartment units. He wouldn't know which was the most profitable which was the most valuable use of those resources. So how can we calculate the cost of producing this car under socialism? Okay. Uh, under, so let's contrast that with, with, with capitalism. So under capitalism, how do we, we know whether we should produce this car or not? Well, there are always, at every moment in time, prices of the factors of production. Every ton of steel has a price. Every gallon of paint has a price. Every kilowatt of electricity has a price. So if you want to produce something and you know the production function, well, then you simply add up the, the prices of all the different factors of production, and that becomes your cost of production. So let's say that um, GM, in producing this car, um, forecasts at the future price, and remember, a car from the drawing board to the time it's produced takes in the US four or five years, OK? So let's say they know exactly, or, or, or they forecast the price at $55,000. Well, then if, they, if the costs of production are calculated at 50,000, then they go ahead, they produce, and if they're correct, though they may be wrong about the future demand for this car, they earn a profit of $5,000. They earn a pure profit. So they go ahead and produce the car. Okay? On the other hand, if they, they, they determine that the future price is only $48,000, and yet it's $50,000 to, to the cost of production, then they don't go ahead and produce. Okay, because they'll lose money. Now, can they make mistakes? Sure they can. They can think that the price will be $55,000 five years hence. Okay, they're looking at a future market. But it could turn out to be $48,000 or $45,000. Okay? And they would then, therefore make a mistake and lose money. But they would know that they made a mistake. Okay? They would know that it turns out that the resources they used had a more valuable use in producing other things 
than in producing that car. Okay? The socialist planner doesn't know any of that. So they keep on doing the same thing over and over again. There's no reason to change. There's no test of, of, of whether their production plan is correct or not. Also, um, how do we know how we should produce this car? Should we produce it with, more, uh, with, with you know, factories traditionally and an assembly line and labor? Or is it cheaper to produce by having robots produce it and having only a few guys in the plants to, 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 to maintain the robots and, the, and, the, and to operate the computers that run the robots? Okay, Which is the more efficient way of producing? We don't know. What kind of bumper should we put on the car? Should we put titanium bumper on the car, okay, which is very strong? Or should we put a steel bumper like we used to in the old days? Or should we use plastic like we do today? Well, I mean, if an engineer might say, use titanium. But the problem with that is titanium has much more valuable uses, the scarce amount of titanium in society, in, 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 in aerospace um, uh, equipment and, and um, uh, airplanes and, 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 and other, other things, OK? So you wouldn't put them. That's why we don't see them on, on automobiles. Okay. So um, they wouldn't know whether or not to produce the good, how to produce the good, what's the cheapest way of producing the good, what resources to use in producing the good, because they can't calculate. Okay. Again, that's not to say that the market economy or that the entrepreneurs are infallible. Okay. They do make mistakes because the future is uncertain. But the future is just as uncertain for socialists, okay, for socialist planners. But yet, they have no way to determine after the fact whether or not they made a mistake or not. <clears throat> okay, this is a, a home um, built in Montana. <clears throat> now, I had a friend I grew up with who uh, actually wound up marrying a real cowboy and living on a real ranch in Montana. And they actually had cattle drives and so on. So one day, uh, she called me up, and we were talking. She said, oh, we got a new house. I said, oh, you moved, moved out from the ranch? She says, no, no, we just had the house brought in. I said, what are you talking about? Um, she says, well, you know, the house was built. The house was built in Omaha, and it was shipped 687 miles to Biddle in, in pieces, you know, in large uh, modular pieces. Now, that's kind of strange, right? But that was the cheapest way of doing it because in the Northeast or here in, in the Southeast, there's a lot of labor, so you have labor come to the site. Labor is cheap, okay, or, or ch cheaper than, 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 than building a factory. However, Montana is like 12 people, <laughs> and they're all cowboys. <laughs> so you know, they don't have the comparative advantage in building homes. So what do you do? It's actually cheaper to have it built in a factory in a city where labor is, is less scarce and then shipped 687 miles to the site where it's then put together by the people that, that, that built it, okay? Now, would a socialist planner be able to figure that out? An entrepreneur figured it out because they saw profits. They said, you know what? It's actually cheaper to do this, okay? Okay, so these are the types of problems that cannot be solved by socialism. And that, that results in, in, in uh, uh, tremendous waste and inefficiency. Now, what was a couple of things about what, uh, criticisms that Mises faced here. Um, one was that, well, you know, people don't have to calculate in, their, in, in all their actions. Well, it's true. M Mises only said this, this applies to an industrial economy, okay, with a multitude of, of, of capital goods and other kinds of factors of production, okay? If there was a very simple Crusoe economy with, where there was only one or two scarce factors of production, like Crusoe's labor and, and, and maybe the, um, uh, the, the land where there, there was where, near, the, near where he could fish and, and, and pick blueberries. So there was hardly, there was really not, not, not much, not many different kinds of, of factors of production. Well, then you could, you could figure out your costs. Okay, without money, by directly valuing, because that was one of the arguments. Why can't, why can't we directly value the goods that, that are being used to produce in a social society? So take this example. Let's say this person works 12 hours a, a, a day and works in three-hour increments, um, spends three hours fishing, three hours picking wild mushrooms, and that's his value scale. Uh, Robinson Crusoe, in this case, then, uh, values all of these things more than whatever else he could use his labor time 
to produce. But now let's say he, de he, de he determines um, that he finds rabbits uh, on, on the island and he, he, uh, and he wants to vary his diet, so he wants to catch rabbits. What's the cost of, of, of catching the rabbit? Okay, and let's say it takes six hours to catch a rabbit. Okay, well, he knows his cost directly. He knows that that six hours, the opportunity cost of, of catching the rabbit would cause him to lose the, the lowest valued use of the six hours, which is eight coconuts and one sack of berries. So he simply says, do I like a rabbit better or do I like eight coconuts and one sack of berries? He can compare them directly. But once you have multiple stages of production, different orders of goods, and all these different capital goods, you can't do that anymore. Okay? It's impossible to do that. Mises recognized that. Okay. Um, the other point I want to make before I, I, I talk about the for, for Soviet Union is that, um, well, actually, let me, let me talk a little bit about this, and then I'll, I'll make the point about the Soviet Union. So in the former Soviet Union, we had gross output planning, um, which uh, under an agency, a central planning agency called Ghost Plan. And um, so what, what, what happened um, in, in this gross output planning a scheme was that each ministry that oversaw an industry was given a certain target, a certain amount of nails to produce, a certain amount of chandeliers to produce, a certain amount of tractors to produce, a certain amount of gasoline. And then each industry head then went and allocated to all the different factories, the factory managers, they were given targets. Okay, So this is a system of mutual lying, of course, right? Because um, the, the, um, the factory managers would always want to say that they couldn't produce as much as they really could. They would always, be, because they know on the other hand that the ministers would always try to get them to produce more than they could produce, okay? So what they wanted to do was to get the target as low as possible and then exceed the target and get a nice vacation on the Black Sea, okay? But if the target was too high, well then they wouldn't meet the target and they get uh, a more rigorous vacation in Siberia, okay? So... So, so they would lie. So, so, so you, you, it, the incentive was to lie about, about uh, on the one hand, you know, the managers lied, but, but of course the ministers and ghost plan knew the managers were lying, so they would up the target. So, so they would, you know, give very low targets and, and, and the others would give high targets and eventually they'd settle on some, uh, some target. Okay. But it was very difficult to specify, okay, without prices, to specify not just what goods produce and how much, but what, what kinds of goods, what qualities of the goods to produce, okay? So um, let me just give you a, an idea of some of the problems that were faced with this uh, way of planning. Um, for example, there were a lot of structures in the Soviet Union, uh, a lot of uh, industrial buildings and, and homes that were completely finished and ready for people to move in, except they didn't have any, any roofs on them, okay? Why didn't they have any roofs? They didn't have any roofs on them because the nail industry only produced very big nails, very he heavy, big nails. They didn't produce the smaller roofing nails that you need in construction. Why did they do that? Because it was easier, because the target was given in terms of tons. So the bigger the nails you produced, okay, um, uh, producing bigger nails was, e was easier to do to, f to, to fulfill your target of certain tons of nails. And here's a famous um, Soviet cartoon. There's the, the manager telling the minister of the industry, well, comrade, I, fu I, I filled my target, okay, you know, with, with that huge nail, okay. Um, what were some of the other problems? Um, women complete, continuously complained that there was no clothing to fit them, petite women in the Soviet Union. The reason? Because the um, uh, apparel industry, was gi uh, they were given a target in terms of yards of cloth, so everybody made huge dresses, okay. Um, and, and it was very difficult to get children's clothing for that reason. Whereas in, t in, in a capitalist economy, of course, you have prices, okay? The, 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 if there's few children's cl clothing or, 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 for, or, or not enough clothing for petite women, not enough dresses and so on, the price of those things shoot up, right? It's high profits to be made and resources are shifted, okay? So that was another thing. Then there was a, a very famous um, co comment that was very cryptic at first that Khrushchev who was the Soviet premier in the 1960s, early 60s and in the 50s. Um, he, he, he was giving a talk about the state of, of, of the Soviet Union and, and its economy, and he began berating the chandelier industry of all industries. Now, wh why would he do that? Well, it turns out that chandeliers, okay, when you produce them, your target was a certain number of tons of, of hundreds of tons of chandeliers. So they made them very heavy. And who had chandeliers? Well, party members, the apparatchiks. And 
they had them in their vacation homes on the Black Sea, and they were falling and killing people when they had dinner parties. Okay, so they're pulling, they're pulling the ceilings down, okay, because they were so heavy. Um, and then there was a famous joke in which, um, uh, well, this, this part isn't a joke. When Khrushchev gave a talk at the U United Nations, he um, uh, was, uh, banged his shoe, famously banged his shoe on the table and said, we will bury you, meaning our economy will outproduce your economy, we'll bury the capitalist economy. So Western economists that were there were talking to the Soviet economists, and Soviet economists said, yeah, we'll bury you except for Hong Kong, because we'll leave Hong Kong as a capitalist nation so we can, we can copy their prices. And that's exactly what the Soviet Union did. So when people say things like, um, well, Mises said that socialism was impossible, but the Soviet Union lasted for 75 years, so Mises was wrong, okay? Um, but the point, uh, the, the, the point was that the Soviet Union wasn't a true um, socialist economy, okay? It copied prices from the West. There were stories of, of Maoist China sending away for, uh, for, um, for uh, catalogs from Sears, which was a, um, a mail order place, a mail order retailer in the United States. Um, so there, these, um, the, the, so the Soviet Union lasted because it was like what Mises would, would, would say, um, an island in the middle of a sea of capitalist prices, okay? So it copied, it also traded electricity, it traded gold and so on, on, on the market, so it had prices for those things, and it also copied Western prices. Now, these, these prices were, were inaccurate when applied to the Soviet economy, okay, because it didn't reflect the true scarcities there, and that's why it eventually broke down. But it wasn't a true socialist economy. It was like the post office, which is, was terribly inefficient, okay, uh, and still is, but it was terribly inefficient before FedEx and UPS and so on. Um, but they could still operate semi-efficiently. Semi Why? Because they had the prices of, of, of all the goods that they needed, even though they weren't using calculation, okay, even though they weren't aimed at, at profits, okay. That's very important. Okay, so let me just say a word about what's called the social appraisement process. So what, the lesson that we should learn from Mises is that costs of production cannot come out of one mind, okay? Cost of production involves everybody interacting in society, you and me and everyone else interacting as consumers, laborers, producers, landowners, and entrepreneurs, okay? So everyone is involved in this, okay? So let me just give you a little schema. So how does this, this, this process work? Well, you have the entrepreneurs in purple in the, in the middle there. They look at what they think future consumer prices are. Now, they know what consumer prices are today for these various items, and they have to forecast. They have to use their judgment of how people's values will change, of how technology will change, to focus on or, or to, to figure out, forecast, and predict what prices will be in the future. All right. Now, given that, what they think prices will be in the, in the future, they then go into the factors of production markets, the markets for labor, the markets for steel, and all other kinds of capital goods, markets for resources, and they bid according to what they think the value of the output of those resources will be. So at every moment in time, you have a structure of consumer prices and you have a structure of factor of production prices or cost of production, okay? Everyone's involved in this, okay? The, everybody's involved as consumers in the market for consumers' goods. Their values are different and they interact in markets and, we, and prices arise, okay, at every moment, okay? There's never a moment when there aren't prices for scarce goods. And the same is true in, in the markets for resources or factors of production. Right. So what Mises says is that although all of us contribute to the price structure, the structure of prices, it transcends any one, any one individual's contribution, which means that it is a truly social phenomenon. It is truly an outcome of society. One person could never replicate the price structure that is used to calculate costs and, and, um, uh, uh, costs and prices and uh, losses and profits, okay? So Mises call that the intellectual division of labor, and it's just, just repeating what I said. Everyone's involved in generating this price structure, okay, through their various roles in the market economy, okay? And the prices are a genuine social phenomenon for, for the reasons that I mentioned, okay? Um, 
So, so getting back to the Soviet Union, there was a period when there was true socialism in the Soviet Union. And that was under the war communism from 1917 to about 1921, okay? Uh, and that was when the, the, there was a civil war between the, uh, the white Russian forces that were, were, in, fa that were uh, in favor of re restoring the Tsar and, 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 and the Red Army, okay? And so the uh, communists have always, uh, always blamed the, that period, the, 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 the poverty during that period, on that war. But it wasn't really the war. What happened was that they, they decided they were not going to look at any prices. They were going to produce without looking at prices at all. And they tried to do that, and things did not work out. In fact, by the end of that period, people were taking their furniture, you know, like fa family heir heirlooms and so on, and burning the furniture just to stay warm. And then they began to burn parts of their apartment buildings. And eventually the cities emptied out. There was no food being produced, and they w the, uh, people would then um, scavenge the countryside for food, for shelter. And it was at that point that the new economic plan was introduced by Lenin, in 1922, which was a five-year plan in which there was limited private property in gardens and so on, uh, so that people could grow food, and they were beginning to look at Western prices. Okay, so true socialism, when it was tried, what, what did it break down into? It broke down into bands of small groups roaming the countryside, okay? So socialism can exist on that level, on that very primitive level. <laughs> Okay, so what were some of the um, responses to Mises? Okay, I, people took this challenge very, very seriously. As I said, it was a straightforward and clear argument. So in the 1920s, there were a number of German Marxists that responded. Okay, this, this debate between the socialists and Mises didn't really hit the, um, uh, the, uh, the English-speaking world until the 1930s. So the first was... Um, well, you know what? Uh, we can have calculation in kind, okay? Um, that is, we'll just add up gallons of paint, tons of steel, kilowatts of electricity. This was uh, proposed by the fanatical Marxist Otto Neurath, okay? And um, of course, it was just stupid. I mean, he, he didn't learn, you know, as we all learn in, in, in elementary school, that you can't add apples and oranges, Otto. So, you know, he he didn't, he, so so Mises, Mises had already dismissed that, had already refuted that fallacy in his original article. Um, the second was, well, let's calculate with labor hours, right? Okay, because labor is what produces value, according to, 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 to Marxists. And Marxists work, by the way, picked up the value theory of the, of, 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 of the classical economists, okay? Um, but now what's the problem with that, okay? Is labor really homogeneous? Is every hour of labor like every other hour of labor across all human beings in the labor force? Of course not, okay? You have McDonald's ca uh, cashiers, you have software engineers, brain surgeons. How do you figure out the difference in value between a brain, uh, an hour of a brain surgeon's time and an hour of a, a cashier's time, okay? It's impossible, right? So the hours are, even though they are, you can say they're an hour of labor, they aren't identical, right? Also, um, even in the same industry, uh, for example, a basketball team, you have LeBron James and then you have the gawky 12th man sitting on the bench in, 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 in a basketball, uh, on a basketball team. Okay, so, so that, 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 that didn't fly. Um, also, it didn't account for the different capital goods. Um, you can have two people, one working with a shovel, digging a ditch, another person working with a backhoe. Okay, who's going to be more productive? Okay. An hour of, of the guy who's working with the backhoe. So you leave out of account the value of capital, the value of using capital. That's not counted. And, and so then production becomes chaotic. Um, or we can, uh, the, so the Marxists came up with another solution. They said, look, what we'll do is on the last, on the first day of socialism, we'll tell everybody to come to work and do the same jobs in the same way you did it the day before, the last day of capitalism. Okay, so we'll tell the managers to manage it in exactly the same way. Okay, so what are they saying here? Anyone can do that, but that ignores the fact that the whole point of having an economy is to be able to move resources to their most highly valued uses, which are continually changing. Okay, people's values are changing. There's fads and so on. Uh, technology is continually improving. This would only work 
if people were just robots who bought the same things every day and no one discovered any new, new process and we never had any more um, natural resources and na the natural resources that we did have never ran out, everything would have to be exactly the same for every day in the future for this to work, okay? So, of course, it was just nonsense. And again, Mises refuted this in that first article. Now, there was a little bit more of a, a sophisticated response from neoclassically trained economists, economists who were not Marxists, but who had a leaning towards socialism. Um, and these tended to be in, 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 in um, Great Britain and in the United States, okay? So they were well-trained in, in, in neoclassical economics, which was becoming, in the 1930s, starting to become mathematical, okay? So there was... Um, the trial and error method in which uh, the, the, bar, the uh, um, socialists said, well, you know, uh, capitalism isn't perfect. Uh, the prices are often wrong under capitalism. They have to be changed. People make mistakes by looking at these prices and so on and so forth. And that's all true. But we know that entrepreneurs can figure out that they're making mistakes. Uh, on, on, under socialism, how would they f find the right prices? There's no way to find it. Uh, Mises said, look, um, with, with trial and error, uh, if a man loses his wallet, okay, he knows exactly what he's looking for. He knows in advance what the wallet looks like. So when he comes upon it, okay, he'll try different areas where he, let's say he'll backtrack and find out where he went, remember where he went and go to those places. And when he comes to it, he'll know that he's found it and that's the correct solution, all right? Um, but under socialism, they don't know what they're looking for. There are no prices, okay? So you have trial and error. Okay, and you keep making mistakes, but how do you ever know when you're right? Okay, you, you don't. Then there was market socialism, um, uh, uh, which was put forth by a Polish economist, Oscar Lange, and um, by a British socialist, Abba Lerner. And Oscar Lange was the one that said that, you know, Mises' argument was correct and that uh, a statue should be placed in his honor in, um, the, uh, in, in, the whole, in the hall of, of, of socialism or in the hall of the Central Planning Committee in Poland, okay? Uh, you know, it was, of course, a sarcastic remark. But basically what they said was that, look, um, we'll have the uh, Central Planning Board, we'll set prices f both in consumer goods and, and capital goods, okay? And if there's shortages, then we'll ra have, raise the price. If there's surpluses, then we'll have the planners lower the price. And then we'll tell the managers to look at these prices, right, whether they think they're right or wrong, look at these prices and calculate how much to produce, okay, and, and calculate how to produce at the lowest cost using these fake, phony prices, okay. But the whole problem with that solution is that's what Mises called playing market. They're kids playing market. Who owns all those resources? People that own all those resources are the planning board, okay? They're the ones that set up those prices. Right. Now, and it goes deeper than that. Mises pointed out that to have prices, you already have to have goods and factories and so on. But how do we know that these factories are the right factories? How do we know that, that what they're equipped with is, is the correct equipment, the most productive use of resources? So Mises pointed out that capitalism isn't a managerial system where you set up fake prices and you have the, uh, uh, the managers calculate according to those prices. It's a system of, 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 of destruction. That is, you destroy firms that are inefficient and you, you move capital into firms where there's greater efficiency. Okay, so it's an entrepreneurial system. Some people, different people have to own the different resources and actually, what Mises said, expose their destiny to, 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 to their decisions, all right? They can't just play at market. Uh, and last is a mathematical solution. I'll just mention it very briefly because we're, we're, ra we're almost out of time. Um, there, there was a, would be a system of equations set up um, of, of a general equilibrium economy in which there were supplies and demands, and um, uh, so the simultaneous system of, of equations would then um, uh, have emerged from it a system of shadow prices, okay? Um, so, but what Mises pointed out there, and I'll, and I'll stop here, is that, um, in fact, the, 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 um, the, the goods that they were talking about, the supplies of goods that were existing, okay, and the demands for those goods aren't the goods that are relevant 
to production because those are the goods that will come into existence and that have to come into existence as you move towards what the consumers want because there are always mistakes. So you cannot stop today and take all the things that exist today and, and then, and then uh, you know, set up your supply and demand equations because what exists today, many of those things were produced in error. Too, much of, too many railroads were produced in the past, not enough highways, okay? Uh, too many trains, not enough airplanes, and so on. So you don't want to use those supplies in your, in, in, in your simultaneous system of simultaneous equations, okay? So I'll stop it here. Thank you.